It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bobby Pritt, Professor of uh, Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, uh, where she is also the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology and Medical Director of the Clinical Parasitology Lab, uh, hence all those uh, costumes we were talking about before. Uh, she completed her medical training at University of Vermont College of Medicine, followed by a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology, and then fellowship in a medical microbiology here at Mayo. Uh, she's also obtained a Diploma of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene from the Royal College of Physicians in London, England, and has a long interest in the discovery and history of infectious diseases. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of that here uh, today. Uh, Dr. Pritt's main professional areas of interest are medical parasitology, vector-borne illnesses, diseases, and uh, the pathology of infectious disease. And she shares her passion for medical parasitology um, on her uh, parasite case blog, so creepy, dreadful, wonderful parasites, and on social media, her handle is at Parasite Gal. And today she's going to be talking on the related topic, this creepy, dreadful, <laughs> wonderful viruses, uh, just in time for us to celebrate for Halloween. So thank you so much, Dr. Pritt. Well, thank you, Dr. Kreider, for that great introduction and the opportunity to be here to uh, have our own little DLMP Halloween celebration. So yes, indeed, I will be talking about viruses today rather than parasites, but they also are creepy, dreadful, and sometimes wonderful. So I have a series of spooky tales to scare and amaze. So following participation today, uh, my objectives are that participants should be able to describe the discovery and characterization of some notable viruses in our history, some in the fairly recent history, discuss the clinical presentation of select viruses, and state how creepy, dreadful, and wonderful viruses can be. So I have a series of four cases for you. The first one is a case of a nameless foe. I'm gonna set the time and the stage for you. This is New Mexico in 1993. And the slides in the case I'm gonna share with you, the cases are courtesy of Dr. Ross Semwald, who is one of our medical examiners here at Mayo. So the setting is Gallup Indian Medical Center in New Mexico. The office of the medical examiner was called to a death at the hospital. It was a 31-year-old Native American woman who had been previously in good health, but had this very short three-day history of flu-like symptoms with myalgias, fever, weaknesses. She became short of breath. She vomited, was admitted to the hospital, and died that night. So this is scary. A 31-year-old, otherwise healthy woman shows up with a four-day history, just goes rapidly downhill and dies. This is her chest x-ray showing extensive pulmonary edema. And uh, the medical examiner was notified that uh, in this case because there was no obvious cause of death, no injuries, no drug history. So an autopsy was performed by Dr. Patricia McFeely, a pathologist working in New Mexico in conjunction with the Office of the Medical Examiner. The autopsy showed pulmonary edema, as we expected from the chest x-ray, pleural effusions, the cultures were negative, toxicologies were negative, the cause of death was unknown. So this could have just been written off as one of those cases where we just don't know what happened, and it might have just disappeared into history, had it not been for a second case that occurred uh, just one month later with this gentleman, another young, previously healthy man, 19-year-old Native American man who died unexpectedly while en route to his fiance's funeral, very healthy, fit man who was actually a local champion marathoner, and he also had a three-day history of very similar symptoms, body aches, fever, chills, vomiting, um, and finally collapsed, and it turns out his fiance had died just three days previously with similar symptoms. So we now have three cases of this unknown rapid death in otherwise healthy individuals. Interestingly, the fiance had been admitted to a hospital in Arizona near the New Mexico border 
but in a different state, different jurisdiction, and her death had not been reported to the county medical examiner, and her certificate just was signed out as pneumonia. Now, thankfully, in New Mexico, the medical investigator had very close ties with the Navajo community, and there was a lot of confidence in the community with the medical examiner's office. So the family gave permission, not just for this man's autopsy, but his fiance's autopsy as well. Well, the autopsy findings showed pleural effusions again, pulmonary edema and congestion, a little bit of you can see here in this image, but the toxicology again were negative, the cultures were unrevealing, every bacterium virus that we could culture for routinely at that point were all negative. Now the investigator though really took it that further step as our medical examiner office often does, went to the rural home of the man and his fiance. And this is a picture here on the bottom. No environmental toxins were found, that was a concern. Family members were interviewed. There, were no his there was no history of traditional medicines being used. No illicit drugs were reported. But there was a lot of interest in this case. We now have these three cases occurring just within one month of each other. And as this became a little bit more public, additional cases started to get reported, fatal and non-fatal. And autopsies all showed the same findings, the pleural effusions, pulmonary edema. And most cases, interestingly, occurred in this four corners area where New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona come together, this region that's shaded here. And this just so happens to be the area of the Navajo Reservation, the largest reservation in the country. So what was the cause of death? As you can imagine at this point, it was quite a wide differential. Was it in some unknown infectious disease? Was it an environmental toxin, bioterrorism agent, illicit drugs, Native American home remedy? Well, obviously this is gonna have a different level now when these additional autopsies are being performed. They're now done under BSL-3 guidelines due to the unknown route of transmission, the potential spread of aerosolization during autopsy. And extensive workups were done, histopathology, special stains, cultures, immunofluorescence, they were all negative. So we have all these new autopsies coming in, still no known cause of disease. So what is going on here? Well, this really uh, turned into something. This was a big event. Word got out. The authoritative National Enquirer weighed in with their explanation, which is mystery Indian disease was germ warfare accident. Um, and they had photos from published from the funerals, germ warfare test accident killed Navajo Indians. Um, very sensationalized headlines. This is from People, the death bug in the heart of Navajo country, mysterious lung swelling virus. And the Native Americans in this region were really starting to get singled out. They felt singled out and they were singled out and were made to feel unwelcome in their community. So tension grows between Navajos and the media. And you started seeing signs posted on the reservation, no news media media allowed. All right, well, meanwhile, all of this is going on. We still don't know the cause of all of these deaths of these other uh, wise, healthy individuals. So the CDC Special Pathogens Branch was notified and they found an answer through serologic testing. So serologic testing revealed the causative agent. This is where we're going to use chat where you can type in what kind of virus, do you know this history and this story and what kind of virus was actually implicated of the ones listed here. Some of you may know this story. We teach this to medical students of the Four Corners outbreak. It's pretty famous. All right, I see a lot of people typing in E. Yes, this is hantavirus. This is the big hantavirus, pulmonary hantavirus syndrome uh, outbreak in the Four Corners region. The CDC was able to see weak cross-reactivity in these patients that had died with IgM and IgG antibodies to some known hantaviruses that they had. Hantaviruses, that's a general family, but there are multiple different uh, individual hantaviruses. And these are some examples. We still didn't know what specific hantavirus was implicated. But what we did know is that hantaviruses are spread by rodents. And the University of Minnesota got funding then to test rodents to try to target the source of if rodents were actually involved, and if so, which rodent. 
So virus and rodent droppings a suspect. They went in, um, investigators, and found rodents in all of the different sites of all of the individuals, all the cases. They also looked at people who were not involved. The cases were significantly more likely to have high contact with rodents. And it turned out that the deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus, was the culprit where they found most of the cases. In fact, 30% of the deer mice that they tested were positive for hantavirus. So the media had something new to talk about, which was good. The deer mouse may be the illness culprit. So thankfully the Native Americans weren't getting uh, blamed for this anymore. So this whole timeline was really very rapid. We had our Sentinel case on April 12th, two additional cases the following month, almost one month ahead of that. The task force was formed in New Mexico. Uh, the CDC was called. The CDC arrives a few days later, and then the hantavirus antibody was found in June. And then later on in November, the virus was actually grown in culture. So it's pretty impressive for an epidemiologic investigation. In total, by September, there were nearly 40 cases all coming from these Western states and really focused on that Four Corners area. And this is one of the reasons I picked this virus, besides the fascinating history, is that this is one of those creepy, dreadful viruses. The mortality rate was about 70%. Later with treatment, it, it's about 40%, but it's all supportive care. We don't have antivirals. And so um, it's still a very high mortality rate. And you see this in people that are otherwise healthy, which is rather frightening. So the disease is called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, but there are multiple viruses Viruses, multiple hantaviruses that cause this. So what were we going to name this new virus? Originally, the name was Muerto Canyon virus. That was what was proposed. But because the Navajos and the Hopi Indians and just the Native Americans living in that area were just facing so much stigma, there was rightly a lot of pushback against making a geographic association with the virus. And so eventually they came up with a much more neutral name for the virus, very neutral, and that is Sonombra virus. Sonombra means without a name, which is why I called this case the nameless foe. This to this day is the name of this virus, the virus without a name, that's its official name. Now we know the virus is shed in the feces and urine of infected rodents, so there are a lot of uh, brochures, information for the public on how to uh, prevent this mouse from making a home in your house. And the once the virus is shed in feces and urine, it can survive for days in the environment. So you definitely want to avoid rodents in your home. I'm going to now set the stage with the theme that will recur throughout this. This is my haunted house for you today. And bad pun alert, this is, you could also call it a hanta house, but we'll call it our haunted, our haunted hanta house. And we're going to add the first culprit to our haunted house, the first resident of this haunted house, which is a rodent, because all of the hanta viruses are shed through the excrement of our infected rodents. There are other hantaviruses in the Americas, in case you were wondering. It's not just Sonombra virus, and um, they are all vectored by rodents, but Sonombra virus is the most important cause of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in the United States. Um, there's also some we find in the Americas. And if you're interested, this is some uh, reading I would recommend, a look back from 2018 on the 25th anniversary of the Four Corners outbreak. So, this is where we are here. These are, uh, this is the most recent data I could find from the CDC on hantavirus pulmonary syndrome cases cumulative throughout 2019. And you can see we have cases in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, Gretchen Johns asked, do mice get sick with the virus? Not necessarily. So they serve as just inadvertent vectors. Um, and because they're throughout the United States, and you can see cases throughout the United States, you want to be careful when you're cleaning up after rodents. If you have a cabin or a shed and it's infested with rodents, I would recommend getting a, a respirator from your local hardware store if you're going to clean it out. 
for the reason that we even had cases in Wisconsin, when I had the CDC group up to my cabin a few years ago, they uh, came up to collect ticks and we were working up some tick-borne infections and they also caught and trapped rodents and dissected them. And here we are on this hot summer day and yet they're all wearing these suits with these N95 masks. And that was because of the fear of hantavirus, even in Wisconsin. Now, associated question. What other virus is also associated with rodents? This one is probably a more advanced question for those of you who like your microbiology. So you could just type into the chat if you know of any other viruses associated with rodents. Wow, so we're getting some great choices. Yeah, people are typing in B, and that is the correct answer. Loss of virus found in Africa is associated with rodents. These others are not. Some are associated with that. Some are associated with mosquitoes. So rodents, more about rodentia. That's the, the family of rodents. These are the diseases transmitted directly by rodents. There's our hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, loss of fever, various bacteria and viruses. They are the most numerous of existing mammals. So out of all the mammals on this planet, they are the most numerous in terms of species and the number of individuals, which is rather striking. And of course, that includes mice, rats, porcupines, beavers, uh, capybaras, and other nine mammals. So, our, our rats, our rodents definitely include a place on our haunted house. Now we're going to go on to another uh, member of our haunted house as shown by this case number two, the draft of death. And this is now in Bangladesh in 2005. I will tell you right away that the virus is not unknown in this case. It is Nipah virus. You may have heard of Nipah or you may not have. Um, it's more of the exotic virus found in Asia and other warm tropical areas. In this case, there were 12 patients that were infected of whom 11 died. And this is in 2005 in Bangladesh. This was the fifth outbreak in four years that Bangladesh had. So that's a huge, that's a very high infectivity and mortality rate. Um, and looking back, we knew about Nipah virus from 1999. So we had known about it for a few years. It was actually associated with infected pigs and bats. And it was in Malaysia where they had pigs that were being raised for food. The pigs were huddling under trees. Most of the trees were gone. So um, because of deforestation, there were just a few trees. And then you had these massive collections of bats that would roost in these trees and would drop their excrement and, um, and chew on fruit and then drop the fruit with their saliva on it. And then the pigs would feed um, on the infected fruit or co the contaminated soil, and then they would get infected and then humans got infected. Well, interestingly though, in um, Bangladesh, those risk factors were not present. Uh, this is a predominantly Muslim country. They did not raise pigs for food. Um, they did not have contact with pigs. Uh, no one had contact with bats. So with any epidemiologic investigation, you now have to go in and find out what did the infected people have that the uninfected people did not have? What exposure? And so they started asking all sorts of questions. Um, where did you have contact with ducks? Um, did the infected people have contact with ducks? Well, yes, but there was no difference between infected and not infected people. Uh, what about food ingestion? Guava, bananas, star fruit? Again, no uh, definitive difference between the infected individuals and healthy ones. So they, they went on with this and asked about every possible association they could find. And one finally came out. And that source of infection it was date palm sap. And the date palm sap is a seasonal delicacy in Bangladesh. You get it from the date palm and it's specifically the sugar date palm. You collect the sap in these clay pots. This is a photograph um, from the Institute of Medicine's workup and report of this Nipah virus outbreak. And what they do is they scrape away some of the bark. So they damage the tree, the tree bleeds and its sap is like its blood. Uh, so the, the, the sap, leaks uh, from this damaged area. It's collected by this little funnel. It goes down into this clay pot and then the tappers sell it door to door and on the roadside and it's consumed fresh. In fact, it usually is consumed within a few hours and then it gets considered to go bad or you boil it down, you make it into molasses or you ferment it. Well, with Nipah virus, we knew there was an association with bats 
And there was a previous ob observation of bat excrement on the outside of some of these clay pots. So the investigators from the CDC that went to Bangladesh installed infrared cameras to try to find out if bats really were contaminating the, the sap that was collected. And they did note that. This is a picture from their infrared camera. And here's a bat flying up. Here's that clay pot. There's that little um, kind of siphon down. And you can see where the sap would drip down. And a typical tree got 49 bat visits per night. And the bats drank the sap 29 times on average. We think that these infected bats uh, either contaminated the sap with their saliva their, or their excrement, but bats were seen to urinate directly into the pot. And so it's pretty clear that that's how the clay, that's how that pot got infected and that's how the sap got infected. So going back to our haunted house, I think we have to add bats. Bats are actually associated with a lot of infectious diseases. I just bring up Nipah virus because it's a, another one of those more exotic viruses with a very high fatality rate, definitely in the creepy dreadful category. But more about, you know, why bats? Well, there's more than 200 viruses that have been associated with bats. They're all RNA viruses. And um, there's a lot of bats. They're not as numerous as rodents, but there are more than 1,300 species. Essentially, a quarter of all of the recommend, uh, recognized species of mammals are bats. So one out of every four mammals is a bat um, of the species, not necessarily numerically, but by the number of species. So what are some other things that may increase the chance of them serving as a vector of disease to humans? Bats are very social. They roost in these huge, closely packed aggregates. It, for example, in Carlsbad Cavern in Mexico, um, the Mexican free-tailed bats gather together in groups of 300 per square foot. So picture that, how many little tiny bats gather together. And in this environment, they've actually found aerosolization transmission of rabies. Rabies isn't usually transmitted by aerosolization, but the bats are infecting one another just by the air they breathe because there's so many of them. Also, it's a very old lineage. They are thought to have evolved from their present form about 50 million years ago. And probably as the bat lineage is split, their passenger viruses split and then evolved separately. And so you got many more new viruses. Also, bats migrate. The insectivorous bats will migrate as much as 800 miles, so they don't stay in one spot, and they don't stay in one dimension. Bats move in three dimensions, so they inhabit a far greater volume of space than most animals. Um, you know, instead of like a grazing cattle or a pig or, or even a rodent, they're flying up in the air, they're roosting in trees, they're down on the ground, and the changes in ecology have led to increased contact with humans so, for example, <clears throat> this picture is of the Amazon forest with this large tract of land that had been burned to make way for agriculture. And this forest land has a lot of wild animals in it that now humans will come right up against and have potential increased uh, contact. If you're interested in all of this, it's a fascinating topic. I would recommend this book. It's written for the general public, but it's done very well. It's written by this author who's a known science author, and he did a very good investigation. So it's called Spillover, Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. And given that this was written before the COVID-19 pandemic, and it basically predicted the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's a really fascinating look at zoonotic infections. Okay, I'm gonna go on to case number three. Now we're going to go a little closer to home with an ancient scourge, Minnesota, 1925. And I'd like to thank our own Dr. Epen Jacob for sharing the slides on this case and making me aware of this case. Um, he was aware of this when he was a resident. Um, I picked up the case in uh, historically, of course, and started investigating it uh, as a consultant and did some additional studies on it that I'll share with you today. But let's go to the presentation. 1925, we have a 27 year old man who on January 13th had severe headache, fever and anorexia. Two days later, he had vomiting, coryza, sore throat and nasal obstruction. Does anyone want to type in what they think would be in their differential, given that it's 1925? So we have one person saying smallpox, chryza, sore throat, nasal obstruction. 
I'd say another thing to consider would be measles. You think of, yep, and I got some measles, good, and diphtheria. Remember, measles is, are the three C's, the cough, conjunctivitis, and coryza, and then you get the coplic spots in your throat, and oral mucosa, I mean. Um, so you have to think of all of these. Well, then on the next day, he developed an eruption of discrete papules that did not look like measles. Um, they were on his face, his chest, his throat. He was hospitalized at that point. Uh, he had increased skin involvement the next day. It spread to all of his, his extremities. And then he developed bloody oral mucosa, which is a very bad sign for this disease. And he was febrile this whole period. And then two days later, he became cyanotic, extremely weak, and then died. So 1925, we probably didn't have the same ability to intubate and provide oxygen to people. And so this is a fatal diagnosis. An autopsy was performed and further history was obtained. It turned out that this patient had a brother who died of smallpox seven days earlier. And then the patient and all of his family members became vaccinated, but that was only about a week. They basically became vaccinated that afternoon after the brother had died. So it probably wasn't long enough for him to develop protective antibodies. And it turns out that Minnesota was having, they were in the midst of this huge outbreak, 4,000 cases, over 500 deaths, 400 of them were from Minneapolis. And uh, this was a picture from one of the newspapers at that point. And so it was the largest outbreak in Minnesota and actually the last um, fatal cases in Minnesota. And from the autopsy, the pulmonary findings, the lungs were markedly congested and modeled and histopathology showed a lot of intraalveolar hemorrhage. And you can really see that here, our more normal morphology, open alveolar spaces, good area for gas exchange, not so much in this area, all the alveoli are filled with blood. So the cause of death in this case was hemorrhagic smallpox, which really belongs in the creepy and dreadful category of viruses. Uh, the vi smallpox is known as variola. So variola virus is an orthopox virus. There's two main forms of disease. Variola major is the more significant, more fatal version, and variola minor, but it's still the same virus. And then there are these rare forms, hemorrhagic, which our patient had, and malignant, and they both have a very high fatality rate, 80 to 90%. This really is an ancient scourge. It's believed to have originated over 3,000 years ago. It's been found in Egyptian mummies. It's spread by aerosolization, airborne route, person to person. It's also spread by fomates uh, from the scabs, skin lesions, so direct person to person contact, or if the scabs get onto sheets and then people touch those sheets, uh, blankets, then they can also get smallpox in that way. So this was such a serious disease in China, they actually started inoculating people to prevent smallpox in the 1500s. And they used variolization, which actually is when they took the variola virus and they tried to inoculate a bit of a crust into the nostrils of an uninfected individual. So they're actually, there's some risk with that. You're giving someone actual smallpox, but in a route that might lead to weaker disease less serious disease, but it was in 1796 that Edward Jenner introduced the modern smallpox vaccine, which was used in the United States right up until the 70s. And that was a different virus, Vicinia virus. And there's some question of whether that actually came from cowpox, uh, cowpox virus or if it was another form of smallpox virus. So let's talk a little bit about smallpox, something we do not have with us anymore, thankfully. It begins as that upper respiratory infection with fever and vomiting. Um, there is this uh, incubation period beforehand, and then the skin lesions develop a few days later, and you get these confluent skin lesions uh, often across your face. This is a picture from the Illinois Department of Public Health. And the skin lesions go through the set evolution. And this is something we always teach people, although it's less relevant today, but we teach that all the lesions are in the same stage, which is different from chickenpox, where they actually go through different stages. You see some in like the early stage, whereas some have already crested over and you might see that side by side. In chickenpox, they all begin where the epidermal cells degenerate, they start getting fluid accumulation, you get vesicles, some of them coalesce into multiloculated bulla, and then the roof eventually dries and flakes off, and then you're left with a pitted scar. And almost everyone has scarring from this. 
Now, this is where it got really fascinating for me because we have autopsy specimens here at Mayo going back to 1898. And we don't just have the reports, we have the archival tissue. So we could go back to tissue from people who have died back to 1898. And so Dr. Jacob had done this and I decided to do it myself. Now, you know, normally for those of you who aren't anatomic pathologists, uh, usually our tissues these days are in these nice little cassettes with well-defined areas of paraffin where the tissue is embedded. But if you go back to the archival, archival tissues, they're just blocks of paraffin that are free floating. They come with these little strips of paper around them with the autopsy number on them. If you're not so lucky, they come all melted together, like this case. Um, and then you have to kind of pry them apart and figure out which block came with which. But they're full of tissue. And that tissue can be analyzed by light microscopy, uh, histopathology, electron microscopy, PCR even. And that's what we did with this case. So this is uh, sections that I took. Dr. Jacob had done something similar where we have the skin lesion. Here is the epidermis. And you can see up here, the epidermal cells are starting to degenerate. They're starting to fill with fluid. And this is the beginning of a vesicle. You can see that here as well. And I'll go back a second here, um, especially here, you can see some eosinophilic inclusions that are cytoplasmic. Does anyone know what the name of those inclusions are called? We have names of all the different types of inclusions and it's no different with smallpox. So these are guanary bodies. Oop, I think I left an eye out of there. Uh, cytoplasmic, which is a bit unusual for a DNA virus. DNA viruses, most of them replicate in the nucleus, but uh, the <clears throat> pox viruses replicate and have inclusions in the cytoplasm. And you can see them here. It's kind of amazing that this is tissue that's over 100 years old, but you take a section of it and do light microscopy, you stain it, and it looks beautiful. It looks like something we obtained yesterday. And so because Dr. Jacob had done this, I wanted to try it too. And so I submitted it for electron microscopy to get my own images. Here are clusters of viruses shown in red. And on higher power, you can see the viral particles that are still very recognizable in this tissue. And they have a very characteristic dumbbell shape where they kind of pinch in in the middle and then they go out on both sides. And this was a great example showing that yes, indeed, those viral particles are still there. Uh, presumably they're all inactive now, but this 100-year-old tissue still has clear evidence of our viruses. So this is a deadly disease. Uh, yeah, the World Health Organization say, says that this is one of the most devastating diseases known to humanity, up to 30% mortality, with 65 to 80% of survivors having these deep pitted scars all over their body, also blindness. This is a picture from the World Health Organization's data archives, and this was fairly common. Um, in the 18th century, one in 10 children in Sweden and France died of smallpox, so it was a deadly disease. It was even worse in Russia, one in seven. And as recent as 1967, which is not that long ago, um, many of our parents or even ourselves might've been alive in 1967, um, there were 15 million cases worldwide. But we eradicated smallpox. It is the only human pathogen that we have eradicated to date. And eradication means when you wipe it off the face of the earth. So there are some stocks still in freezers, but otherwise there is no natural spread of this virus anywhere on earth. The last naturally occurring case was in 1975 in Bangladesh, and then eradication was declared in 1979. So does anyone know how eradication, how can you eradicate something? We have lots of terrible diseases. What are some of the prerequisites um, to allow someone to successfully eradicate a virus off the face of the earth? No animal vectors. That's really important. If, it's, if there are animal vectors, the chance that you're gonna be able to cure all of the rats and the bats of this virus are pretty slim. And then vaccines, people are saying you've gotta have the vaccines. There are a few other factors. Um, so a, a good route, like direct person to person spread, not through mosquitoes. So again, no animal or insects, uh, no animal reservoir. The infected individuals have to be readily identifiable. So in this case, they have a characteristic rash, so you can quarantine them, um, keep people that are infected away from uninfected people. Obviously you have to have an effective vaccine, but 
you also have to have people willing to take the vaccine. There has to be political will, and you have to have that extensive political will to get the vaccine to every remote rural corner of the world. Think about going to rural villages in sub-Saharan Africa or India where you have to walk several days just to get to them and what that must have taken. But there was global political will and so it happened. There's only one other virus that we've eradicated, and it's an animal virus. It caused uh, rinderpest, rinderpest virus, which was also a terrible disease that resulted in many people starving, but it infected cattle and oxen and bison and other animals, ruminants. So back to our haunted house, we have our rodent, we have our bats, and now we have our witches, a pox on you. So there are many poxes, small poxes, but one of them. Which of the following diseases is the great pox though? It was called the great pox, written down and very clear in our history as the great pox. So interestingly, it's syphilis, it's actually F. Syphilis was the great pox. So this is really interesting. Syphilis has a lot of skin manifestations. In fact, if you go back to the 1900s, it was not just the field of dermatology, it was the field of dermatology and syphilology because syphilis was considered so ingrained in the practice of dermatology that you had to include it. And so like the first journals were the Journal of Dermatology and Syphilology. <laughs> um, Syphilis has skin components in its initial, the primary and secondary forms of disease, and it formed various pox, P-O-C-K-S, but sometimes got spelled pox, P-O-X, and like pock marks. It's basically just a rash. And so syphilis was considered the great pox. And smallpox was actually named to differentiate it from syphilis as the great pox. Smallpox was the smaller of the two, the smallpox, which is quite interesting. So we talked a lot about creepy and dreadful, for sure. I just gave you three examples of very creepy, dreadful viruses. But wonderful too, is that a bit of a stretch? Well, let me give you an example of how viruses can be wonderful. And maybe wonderful means inspiring wonder. So not in our colloquial, colloquial way we use the term, but just uh, very interesting. So. Case number four, my last case, is called A Thing That Devours. And this setting is in Egypt. The year is 2015. The case is a 68-year-old American man with diabetes who presented with acute onset of vomiting, diaphoresis, and weakness while vacationing with his wife in Egypt. He uh, was sick enough. He didn't usually go to the physician, but because he um, was just so sick, they brought him to a local clinic that had been recommended by their healthcare provider because these are Americans and they had international health insurance. Um, he was given IV fluids for suspected viral gastroenteritis, but he didn't get any better. So then he developed severe back pain. And these two individuals had health training, healthcare training to some extent. So they were worried that this was pancreatic and they, uh, he was brought urgently to the local clinic where they also suspected acute pancreatitis and were able to diagnose that his lipase levels were through the roof. So they inserted an NG tube down. Uh, they got a lot of bilious material out of his stomach. He was given broad spectrum antibiotics, but his condition continued to worsen and deteriorate. So he was flown emergently to Frankfurt, which was the closest place where they could give him modern medical care, uh, e extensive critical care. He was admitted to the intensive care unit. Now he, when they did imaging, uh, was also noted to have a big pseudocyst and it was, uh, it had characteristics from the CT that it was actually an abscess. It was filled with pus and other fluid. So he had acute pancreatitis with a 15 centimeter wide pseudocyst. Now they did an emergency endoscopy because they were worried he had a biliary obstruction. And sure enough, they removed a four millimeter gallstone from the common bile duct. And then they aspirated out a lot of this brown murky fluid from the pseudocyst. They definitely suspected it was infected. And sure enough, they cultured it and they found multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter baumannii and Candida glabrata. 
They did antimicrobial susceptibility testing and found that the acinetobacter was susceptible only to three drugs, which were really the big guns, meropenem and ticlocycline are two of our big drug antibiotics, and then colistin is really a drug of last resort because of all the toxicities. So they started him on meropenem and ticlocycline, and at that point they stabilized him enough that they could transfer him back home to California at La Jolla at the Thornton Hospital. And at that point, they retested his uh, acinetobacter, and it was now resistant to the remaining three antibiotics. So he now has this serious, potentially fatal infection, a very deadly infection with pancreatitis, this big infected pseudocyst, and his organism is in, um, resistant to every single antibiotic we have. So what do we do? He developed dis disseminated infection and became comatose. Well, when there are no antibiotics left, you have to come up with other solutions. And in this case, it was phage. And Dusty mentioned the perfect predator. So I am indeed telling you the story from a book that I'll, I'll show you later called The Perfect Predator, where the wife worked very hard to get a phage to treat her husband. So let's talk about phages. A phage is a thing that devours. That's where I got the name from this case. And it's short for, for bacteriophage. And this is just an example of what a bacteriophage looks like. It was first discovered quite some time ago, 1915 and 1917 independently uh, by two different investigators. They've been parasitizing bacterial prey, uh, presumably for more than 300 million years. And we used to use it before we had antibiotics. In the 1920s and 1930s, there was work done to protect people against Shigella infection. Um, about that time and shortly afterwards in the 40s, we had um, penicillin, the sulfonamides, and so phage fell out of favor in uh, the Western world, but was uh, still continued to be studied and used in Eastern Europe and Russia for quite some time. So thankfully, we still had some ongoing knowledge because now it looks like this is going to be something that may be in our future. This is a pretty striking picture of a bacterium and all of these are bacteriophages that are just uh, parasitizing this bacterium. There are an estimated 10 to the 31 phages. So, and there's probably more, um, there are so many of them and they parasitize uh, big viruses, they parasitize lots of bacteria. So bacterial phage basically means uh, eating a bacterium. That's how they're named. So back to our patient, they came up with a cocktail of several different bacteriophages that seemed to be active against this patient's specific acinetobacter isolate. They administered it intravenously into it and into his abdomen and he regained consciousness in four days. He came back from the brink of death, essentially. He stayed in the ICU and recovered. He is now at home, still recovering. And this is the book that I would strongly recommend. Again, it's written for the general public, but scientifically accurate and has some really interesting information. Um, it's written by the wife and has actually the patient. It's written by the two of them. It's the story of a UCSD psychiatrist, Dr. Patterson, and his wife, Dr. Strathdee. And um, it was Dr. Strathdee who worked with Dr. Spooley to find these three sources of suitable bacteriophage. And um, I would also recommend they published in a scientific journal, Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, how they came up with this cocktail and administered it. And now they travel and they speak on this topic. This is a picture of the two of them. This is uh, Dr. Patterson holding a picture of acinetobacter. And then here's Dr. Strathdee holding a picture of a bacteriophage. Now, Dr. Robert Redford, director of the US CDC said, we should stop referring to the coming post-antibiotic era. It's already here. It's, it's not widespread. But it's, it's here, this patient shows how he would have died. We ran out of antibiotics if we didn't have bacterial phage. So bacterial phages, I have to add them to my list. Here they are, and they are rather creepy looking. But also on my list of my hunted house with my witch and my rodents and the bats, I would also put in a cat. Um, you can maybe say that it, this is a civet cat associated as a reservoir with SARS-CoV-1. Um, 
an owl for owl's eye uh, for cytomegalovirus and owl's eye inclusions. And then last but not least for Dr. Kreuter here is that vampire because Hmm, could vampires be vectors for bloodborne diseases? Or maybe they're just at risk for bloodborne diseases and therefore a vulnerable patient population. Hmm. So I'd like to acknowledge, um, it was actually Dr. Binniger and Dr. Oseki that invited me to give this presentation initially, took me out of my comfort zone to put together a talk on viruses. I have to give credit to Dr. Norgan for helping me brainstorm on all the different ways we could make a hunted hunt a house and all of the different animals. And then again, thanks to Dr. Zumwalt for sharing his slides on Sonoma virus. And uh, Stacey, I don't know if it would be possible if Dr. Zumwalt is, Zumwalt is with us, he might even want to share some of his experience with Sonoma virus, if that's possible. I, I'm here, uh, Bobby. Can you hear me? I can, Ross. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the only thing I would add was it was very interesting that the uh, epidemic occurred in 1993 because of a very wet, warm winter and, and an explosion of the rodent population, which caused a lot more exposure. Mm. And, and currently, they have occasional cases of the hunter virus that are seen in the southwest, but only a few every year. Yeah, it's a great point, Ross. It makes me a little worried about some of the rain we've been having and what we're going <laughs> to see with climate change, too. Uh, first question we have here that's that's been upvoted as well is uh, engineering viruses is a hot topic. How easy or difficult is it to genetically modify a viable virus? Yeah, so that's, I'll probably answer this in two parts. So first of all, you can genetically modify viruses to serve as vectors for all sorts of things, including vaccines and, uh, you know, different genes and you know, possibly cancer therapy. It's not my area. I don't know a lot about that, but people have been working on that now for decades. But then I'll transition and say that bacteriophages, it's actually quite interesting. We're not modifying or, or altering them at all. We're just finding bacteriophages out in nature, usually in sewage <laughs> and other places where they can feed on lots of bacteria. And we're finding them, purifying them, and then testing them against patients' bacteria. And that is tricky. We're we're just getting into this now. Uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Schutz are going to be working on this. We'll have a test maybe in 2022 is what we're predicting, where we're going to actually offer susceptibility testing for phage, for bacteriophage. So what you do is you have a patient who's infected with a bacterium that you have little to no options for, and that specific isolate is then uh, tested against a whole bunch of different, like a library of these live bacteriophages, and you have to see if any of them are active. And bacteriophages are picky. They don't feed on just any bacterium, and they may not even feed on different strains of the same bacterium. So there's going to be a bit of an art to this as well as a science. Huh. Very interesting. You're going to make it harder for me to attract residents into uh -oh. <laughs> a transfusion fellowship. Everybody's going to be wanting okay, to do to come microbiology. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> next question we've got here is, are there any restrictions to working with the smallpox uh, tissue samples that you reference, given, given that it's an, an eradicated virus? Yeah, um, the, there are only a few known and registered stores of smallpox in the world. And those are, as you can imagine, very tightly guarded. Uh, when I was doing residency, I had a fast, I heard a fascinating talk by the Department of Defense where the scientists there actually believe that there are other stores that aren't registered. So I'm sure that if people wanted to do experiments on them, they could, and we might not ever find out. But of the known and registered stores um, amongst the U.S., you know, of, of them, the U.S. is one and Russia is one. Those are very tightly regulated and people aren't allowed to just go do research on smallpox. So if I could dive in for a second, I think the question was also really kind of focused on like here in that we had this, this oh, tissue yeah. that we were able that you were able to go into. I mm -hmm. mean, is that uh, restricted or, you know, or I guess maybe not because maybe it's not viable virus? It's not viable. It's inactivated. And so that wouldn't really fall into an infectious risk. And um, and actually, that's I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Kreider, because 
the, res uh, the resource we have with these uh, archived autopsy specimens is fantastic. Um, you think of the opportunities, and it's an area I'm really interested in. You can go back, for example, and look at people who died of various cancers and maybe subject them to modern uh, analyses to find out what cancers were present. I'm interested in infectious diseases, so I'm interested in going back to like the 1918 influenza, the Spanish flu, and then doing genetic analysis on that. Dr. Norgan and I might do a project on that, looking at the flu and how it changed over time. Um, of course, you need to get IRB and biospecimens approval and approval from the tissue registry to do all of this. Um, so those would be the only regulations at this point to doing that type of research. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So our next uh, highest rated question is, uh, what are the risks to utilizing phages? Um, so working with phages you were kind of ta uh, talking about. Yeah, well, there's, uh, first of all, there's different types of phages. Some phages will go into a cell infected and um, will attack it and lyse the cell. So those would be the lytic bacteriophages. But then some will also integrate themselves into the bacterial DNA. And you'd be worried about, could that actually integrate with human DNA? So you would spe you specifically have to pick, when you're doing bacteriophage therapy, only use the lytic organisms, the lytic bacteriophages, so that there's no concern that they're going to go into the virus and maybe insert their own genetic material and change the, or they're going to go into the bacterium and change the bacterium and make it more virulent or anything like that. So that is a consideration. Um, you're also, you know, there's not a lot known. We haven't been doing this in recent times for very often. Of course, you could pick a bacteriophage that doesn't work. I suppose if it's not purified properly, you might also have adverse reactions. But I'm sure we're going to be learning a lot more about this in the coming years. Yeah. Uh, so the next uh, highest uh, question here we have is uh, Russia had an explosion uh, a few years ago in their smallpox lab that didn't affect storage. But thoughts on uh, escape or potential germ war warfare in the future? Yeah. So the talk I heard from the Department of Defense about 20 years ago now, they actually thought that at the collapse of the Soviet Union that a lot of scientists, maybe not a lot, maybe just a few, that's too many, uh, might have taken some of those frozen stores and escaped with them to other countries and brought them. So there was a big concern about it being used by for as germ warfare. And some of you may recall that for a while they were actually bringing back the smallpox vaccine and healthcare workers were volunteering to get it. Um, those fears have since not disappeared, but have uh, maybe dissipated a bit, but I guess it's always there as a concern. It would be something that would make a pretty terrible lethal bio-warfare agent. Yeah. So uh, I think we're at the hour. One last question. With modern technology, will we start seeing new types of viruses that humans carry with no symptoms and we never thought existed? Well, I'm sure we'll be detecting them if that's the, I think that's the question. And it actually turns out, you know, we have bacteria living us in, in us, in our gut, on our skin, every part of our body, really, um, except well, maybe some places, but of course the GI tract, the, you know, GU tract. Amongst those though, it's not just bacteria, there's viruses. So we have a microbiome that's not just bacteria, but it's fungi, parasites, and viruses. So we already know we have viruses living in us that don't hurt us and maybe even help us. And I think we'll understand that a lot more. But then, yeah, without a doubt, we're going to continue to discover new viruses. Just in the past 10 years, we've discovered two new tick-borne viruses in the Midwestern United States, Heartland virus and Bourbon virus. So yeah, as we start doing more shotgun metagenomics, I'm sure we're going to start finding new viruses that we didn't know existed before. Thank you for participating. Please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.